welcome everybody to the Roll 2020 The Resilient Leaders. I would like to say welcome. Um, could you hear me well? I can hear you well. I yes, see you yes. Yet. What I have just pointed out to you is only the tip of the iceberg. How to say hello in a different language today? We got a ni from Patrick. I got a good day from Andrew, Australia. Oh, good day, mate. Good day, mate. Love it. All right. This is the first time I've I've been on a Zoom platform, and I can't see I can't see any of the people who are on Zoom, which is really hard for me because I I like to interact with people. But is this working okay? Okay, the people in the room, you guys, this is okay. Am I holding it the right way? People are not totally sure. Okay. Oh yeah, and I I need the clicker too. That's great. All right. Okay. If I start doing this wrong. Uh, you have to stop me because I'm not very used to it. Okay, look, I am thrilled to be back here again. Um, I always, always uh, feel so honored and privileged whenever I get the invitation to come back. So thank you, Kun Onwan, and thank you, Dr. Kitty Pong, because, look, I love this program. And anyway, I would always do anything that Dr. Kitty Pong asked me um, because, you know, he is uh, such a, an enthusiastic, passionate um youthful um, uh, and creative person. And, and, what, and this program that he and Kunanewan and others put together is an amazing program because you are such an incredible collection of people. I'm always amazed every year when I look at the list of leaders whom you've managed to bring together for this program. You know, it's always this incredible collection of people from the public sector, from the private sector, from startups, from media, some of my friends that I work with in government. Um, and then this year, it's like the number seems even bigger than before. Even with COVID and all the problems, it's an even bigger program. And actually, it's being able to reach even further and with more people from further away, you know, not just the region, but beyond. So that's one advantage uh, uh, of, of doing a thing, uh, a program like this online. Um, so it's always really exciting and a privilege to be able to, to, to speak to a group of people like you. And, uh, and so I'm happy to be back and to talk to you about why rule of law matters for the sustainable development goals. And I mean, actually, Dr. Kitty Pong mentioned this already. By the way, you know, they call this special lecture. It, it can't be a lecture. I mean, this is, you know, Zoom. I mean, you know, you can't, people can't sit for long lectures. So I'm just, it's just going to be a chat. And, and what's really important, I mean, I'm more interested in the questions you have for me. So I can't see, uh, because, you know, I can't see you, I can't see the, but it, you, ha you can put questions in the chat function, right? And um, I mean, later you can raise your hand or whatever, but in the meantime, put questions in the chat function. And I think that the team is going to be you know, feeding back your best questions. So whenever you think of anything that you want to ask me, well, that doesn't sound right. Did he mean that? Or, well, what about this? Then please put it in the chat and we can have a discussion go. So rather than a lecture, let me just share a few thoughts with you. I mean, I am taking it that you, you know, you all know something about the sustainable development goals. Um, I mean, I don't want to talk too much about it. I'm sure, that, I'm sure a lot of you understand about the sustainable development goals very well. Um, because as you know, and let's see, oh, there they are. Uh, so as you know, like this is the roadmap for the societies that we all want, as, as it says up here, 17 goals to transform our world, which is what we have to do. We have to transform our world. Actually, that transformational agenda is going to be even more important now because as Dr. Kitty Pong said, COVID has set us back in so many ways. We have an economic crisis. We have a health crisis. We still have a climate crisis, which we had before and is not going away. So we are actually falling back. And when I say we, I mean all over the world, in Thailand, but in every country in the world. And so we have to make sure that as we, when we begin to recover from COVID, you know, this recovery has really got to be quite in a quite different direction to where we were before. We have to change our direction 
to head out and away from that impending climate crisis uh, which is threatening us. We really have to be able to transform the inequality. Uh, you know, all those countries, and Thailand is one, but one of many countries, where as, as, as the economy has grown, the gap between the rich and the poor has grown bigger, and more and more people have been left behind, right? So that's something that we have to deal with. And, and so we have to be able to recover with stronger health systems, uh, more equity, more fairness, a better understanding about the people who are being left behind and dealing with the climate crisis. And why is rule of law necessary for that? Well, let's see. Okay, so now. I, I, I'm going to start with a little story about where we came from. Now, um, it's already we've already had this agenda, the Sustainable Development Goals, the 2030 agenda. Um, we're already five years into it. We're one third of the way through. We started it collectively around the world, every country in the world. We started it in 2015. We have to finish it. We have to get to our goal by 2030. We're a third of the way through. Before we had the Sustainable Development Goals, we had a separate, a different set of development goals. We had what were called the MDGs. They were the Millennium Development Goals. They were our goals for the 15 years, the first 15 years of our century. And when I want to talk about why rule of law is so important to the SDGs, I think it's interesting just to start by how different the SDGs are, our new agenda, from our old agenda, the agenda that we were following for the first 15 years of this century, the MDGs. And, and, and if you'd asked me to talk about rule of law and the MDGs, I, I wouldn't have been able to talk for very long. Because, you know, the MDGs, and they were great and they were a good start, but they were something totally different. They were just a limited set of partial targets in some area. Very good targets, very important target, but just a limited set. But the SDGs are an integrated and holistic agenda which covers everything, right? And you see, you know, when you look at those 17 goals, they cover everything that matters to us as human beings, where, you know, getting enough food to eat, uh, addressing poverty, our health, our education, equality. And they include, as Dr. Kitty Pong said, that all important governance goal about peace, justice, and strong institutions, number 16. So we've moved to an integrated agenda which has got governance in it. And that's one easy answer to the question about why is rule of law important for the agenda? Because as Dr. Kitty Pong already told you, you know, it's there. It's there in goal 16. But I want to look at some deeper, more profound reasons. Why is it there? Why is rule of law important to the fight against poverty, to the fight against hunger, to the fight for gender equality, the fight for education? Why does it matter for all of those things? Another aspect about the SDGs, which is different from the NDGs, is that, you know, those partial targets before, you know, reduce poverty by 50%. Now we have to achieve the targets for everybody. And this is really important because I talked about the inequality, which is becoming one of the biggest problems that we need to solve and start solving right now as we get back from COVID, which has actually exacerbated inequalities. So it's a really important thing that we actually have to achieve these goals and the, the, these 17 goals for everybody. Um, and this, this commitment to equality is, is, is reinforced by the fact that two of the goals are about equality itself. Gen goal number five is all about gender equality. Goal number 10 is about uh, uh, equality more generally. And there's a great principle underlying all of the goals which is that whatever we do in, which, in any area, we must leave nobody behind. Another really important thing, and I say this particularly to you, because I know I'm speaking to people from government, people from startups, people from other private sector companies, from media companies, people from the police, from justice, and so on. Whereas the MDGs, the, uh, the Millennium Development Goals, were really just addressed to governments, the SDGs are a multi-stakeholder agenda. Uh, and that's a partnership in which governments, UN, but the private sector and civil society also have a role. So whether you work for a company, an NGO, a media company, um, uh, a government institution, or the UN, and, that, and you pretty much, you know, all of you fall into one of those categories, each of you is a stakeholder. Each of you is responsible 
for playing your part in achieving this agenda. And that's going to be important what I say later too. Now, why does rule of law matter for this agenda? Not just because it's there, but why is it there? Well, for that, we have to ask ourselves, what do we mean by rule of law? And, you know, it's one of those terms that people use in different ways. So we have to be careful about that. Uh, and we in the UN, we have a very clear idea of what rule of law means. So I, I could read out a beautiful and long definition, but I'm just going to focus on four aspects of the UN's official definition about rule of law. So one of the things about rule of law, it's a principle about accountability, everybody being subject to the law, right? That the law applies whether you are President Trump or Nick Booth or whoever else, that everybody must be subject to the law, made accountable as uh, Congress is trying to do right now for President Trump, made accountable when they violate the law. Um, and that applies to companies, and that applies to the government, and that applies to, 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 to individual citizens. So one of the great principles about rule of law is the fact that we are all equally subject to it. And of course, rule of law is about transparency. It's about the fact that laws are publicly promulgated, but also, again, that they are equally enforced, independently adjudicated, right? That principle of rule of law, again, tremendously important. Again, look at, you know, a certain recent attempt to try and overturn turn a famous uh, election result, you know? So some very great pressures were brought on courts, uh, and those courts, you know, upheld the rule of law, and, and they decided cases purely based on the evidence, and irrespective of the of the pressure, the fame, the power of the person uh, coming before them. And a really important part about the rule of law is that the, the, rule, the rule of law means that the laws are consistent with, with the human rights norms and standards. Now, not everybody would agree with this bit. This bit's really important for us in the UN. Now, some people say, no, no, you know, that's going too far. The rule of law is just about, you know, government following the law and government being subject to the law and the laws being public so everybody knows what the law is and whenever the government does something it has to be able to show you which law it is under. And that's all rule of law means. It's something that people call the thin rule of law. Well, we in the UN, we like a thick rule of law because, you know, to be honest with you, what's the value of having a legal system? What's the value of having the rule of law if the laws themselves actually perpetuate inequality, if the laws themselves don't actually guarantee people's basic rights to freedom of speech, um, to education, to decent work, if, if, if those things that matter to us are not actually in the laws, well, you know, it's not a lot of value. If the laws perpetrate inequality themselves, you know, Nazi Germany had laws, many laws, that actually made it clear that Jews didn't have the same rights as other people. So there's no value in a legal system which isn't actually based on equality, based on human rights. And lastly, lastly, I'm pressing a button, but my fourth one, oh, nah, it was just a little sleepy. Go back, 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 back. Okay, I'm sorry, my clicker is behaving very badly. Go back one more. My clicker is there. Okay. The last one is inclusive participation in decision making. Because, you know, I, I suppose in theory, a very wise ruler might come up with a wonderful set of laws, which are beautiful and everyone, you know, meet everybody's needs and meet human rights uh, without actually people being involved in making those laws. But it's not very likely. Actually, for laws to work, for them to meet people's needs, for them to be in line with people's rights, they have to have a role in participating in making those laws. So inclusive participation in decision making uh, is, is, equ is equally a, 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 a core part of the rule of law. People have to be part of the making and the implementation of laws. That we have to have an inclusive and participatory system. So now all of those things are what we mean, we in the UN mean by the rule of law. And when you think about that principle, you see uh, how deep it goes, and you see how 
rule of law is something for everybody in the public sector, for all public servants, as well as for judges and as well as lawmakers. And so when we think about the rule of law that way, we actually find principles of rule of law all over the 2030 Agenda. We find the 2030 Agenda, the Sustainable Development Goals, are full of commitments which relate to the rule of law. So some of them, of course, are very obvious. As Dr. Kidipong already told you, Target 16.3 says promote the rule of law at national and international levels and ensure equal access to justice for all. And again, it's not very difficult to see how rule of law is essential to, for example, looking at the left-hand side, the target to reduce all forms of violence and violence against children. But I mean, let's think about that one a little bit more deeply too. So there's, of course, we need rule of law and law to, you know, and, uh, and the legal system to reduce violence because of course we have to be able to have effective uh, systems to ensure uh, there's no impunity and that people who commit violence will be arrested and prosecuted. But it goes deeper than that because actually the biggest driver of violence is is, is breaches of human rights, injustice. Injustice, people being treated unequally, being denied, uh, denied their rights, that actually is the, the grievances that come from that uh, are the things which drive conflict. So actually, the link between violence and the rule of law is, is very much deeper than that. Can I go back to my slide again? It's nice to see me, but uh, okay. Uh, and that's why when we look beyond, beyond the, through the agenda, we also see, you know, a culture of peace and nonviolence in 4.7. And the rule of law is completely intrinsically linked with a culture of peace because a society which is peaceful and socially cohesive is one that is based on human rights and equality that are actually observed. Uh, re again, uh, reducing violence against women and girls, crucially depends on the rule of law. On the right-hand side, clearly we need the rule of law to fight against uh, an organized crime and uh, recovery of stolen assets. Corruption and bribery is the one of the worst abuses, one of the worst offenses against the rule of law, and it's a plague that we suffer from in almost every country in the world to some extent. Forced labor, modern slavery, human trafficking, those kind of abuses of course need the legal system, the criminal legal system to fight against them as well as other things. And fighting against discrimination needs legal tools and legal basis. So gender equality, non-discrimination, equal opportunity, labor rights, these are all things that need the rule of law. And I think that must be pretty obvious to everybody. But when we look at the other aspects of the rule of law, we can see other targets in the goals which reflect those two. So I told you that the rule of law is a principle about accountability and transparency. And so the principle in the goals that we have to have effective, accountable, and transparent institutions, that's a rule of law principle. And I'm pressing my clicker again. And then if we go down to the bottom right-hand side, inclusive participation in decision-making. We see right the way throughout the goals, reflecting what I just said, that we can't make a better world for ourselves unless we have all had an opportunity to participate in reshaping that world. Participation is a key principle to transforming the world we want. And that's why we have targets in goal 16 about responsive, inclusive, participatory and representative decision making. That's why we need access to information because people can't participate without really understanding uh, the basics, the basis of the, the decisions that government is going to make, the laws that government is intending to pass. Women's participation and leadership gets a special, uh, a special shout out in, in goal five. Social, political and economic inclusion is a key part of the goal on equality. Participation is one of the core things that we have to do across all of the goals that transform our world. And lastly, of course, when I said that the rule of law depends upon 
the laws being in line with human rights. And, and that's really a two-way relationship. So I, I said already that a legal system is, not, is of no value unless it actually is informed by, unless its content is based on human rights. Equally, human rights need laws and the legal system to work. Because when a right is violated, we need a remedy. So the legal system and the rule of law plays a vital role in making sure that, you know, that the human rights that we have in constitutions, that people speak about, that, 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 that countries sign up to in treaties, these things are only valuable on paper. They're a beautiful wall decoration unless we have laws, effective laws, that are independently adjudicated by courts that hold governments, state officials, others accountable when human rights are broken. So every aspect of the rule of law needs to come into play to make sure that the human rights actually work for people. And this agenda, these 17 goals to transform our world, they are a human rights agenda. The main human rights are all represented in terms of the, the right to education, to health, environment, gender equality, you can, you can see almost all the key human rights. There's a very close alliance between the international human rights, rights framework and the 17 goals to transform our role. Uh, uh, and, and equally, the principles about human rights, universality, inalienability, and the principle about, you know, leave no one behind and equality for all the SDGs. These two are very, very strongly linked. So, those are the ways in which, and I've really been very you know, brief about it, but uh, we can talk about it more, but those are the ways in which the 17 goals, the world, the transformation we need to see, how strongly they are linked to the, to the different aspects of rule of law. And I hope you're going to be, as you go throughout this course, really digging deep uh, into the different ways that, that rule of law is, is at the heart of the systems that we need to realize the transformation uh, that the SDGs call for. I wanted to say something about the role of the private sector because so many of you come from uh, private sector companies. And I, and I already told you that one of the great innovations of the SDGs and of the 2030 agenda was the fact that the private sector is now a part of it. It's not just governments, it's the private sector, civil society, the UN as well. This is really important to us because, you know, the private sector has an incredible role in delivering in, with the rest of us in working together to deliver the change we need for the 2030 agenda. Look at it. You know, private sector is driving the growth which is transforming Asia. Private sector activity has a huge potential positive or negative, depending on the acts of private sector companies. So if companies in collusion with uh, government officials take over land that belongs to indigenous people for their operations, or if they cut down forests that belong to indigenous people, if they pollute the environment, if they poison the water, if they pollute the air, right, with, uh, with impunity, those private sector organizations are, are directly affecting the human rights and directly holding back the 2030 agenda, directly holding back the transformation. So they can have a huge negative or positive impact. Because conversely, a responsible company that makes sure that, you know, let's say, you know, like, a company that, uh, that sells shoes and clothes, if it makes sure that the factories that are supplying its shoes and supplying its clothes, if it makes sure that, it, that there's no child labor, that there's no forced labor, that women are paid the same as men, that there are proper health and safety laws, that, that, that international labor standards are, are protected, that company, if it's doing the due diligence about its whole supply chain, that company is doing something very positive to make sure that its power, you know, uh, its power over the suppliers it works with, the decisions it makes about which companies it will do outsourcing with and so on, it's using that power for good. Conversely, a company that kind of closes its eyes, that will just source whatever it wants from the cheapest supplier without worrying about 
you know, how those goods were, were, were produced, that company is not playing the role it should to make sure that the sustainable development goals uh, are being achieved. So the pro private sector has an absolutely um, huge role. And that's why the UN has a set of guiding principles on business and human rights, which are there to actually uh, help provide a level playing field between businesses that are, be are responsible and make sure that they are not being undercut by businesses that are being less socially responsible uh, and that are, are not working as hard to ensure that they have a positive impact on human rights. And I mention that because Thailand is a leader in this area. I, I'm delighted that one of the one of the participants in this year's program comes from the Ministry of Justice and, uh, you know, is herself, you know, a leader in having made Thailand the first country in this region to adopt a national action plan on business and human rights. That's a great achievement for Thailand. Uh, and we really respect Thailand's leadership in it. And now the time has come. Now that Thailand has adopted a national action plan on business and human rights, the time has come for us all to get together and for private sector to work with us to really set the tone, set the standard. And some of you come from companies that we in the UN work with on the business and human rights agenda. And we are standing shoulder to shoulder in helping other companies understand what, what they need to do to, in their supply chains, uh, uh, in their internal operations to make sure that they have safeguards against corruption, they have safeguards and due diligence uh, to make sure that they are only in their, that their supply chains are, 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 don't have any, uh, include any violations of human rights. So that's a really important role that the private sector has to play as well. I was asked to say something about the impact of COVID-19. I've said something about it overall, but I was asked to say something about, you know, now a year later, since I was last here, uh, what impact has COVID-19 had on rule of law? Actually, it's had a lot. And I've written some of them down here you may be able to think of others. Here are some of the things we've seen. I'm not going to mention particularly which countries. You can all think to yourselves whether you recognize these or not. Uh, one of the issues that we've seen, of course, there have been many states of emergency because we have a public health crisis, a public health emergency. And so a lot of states have declared states of emergency, which they are entitled to do. But of course, a state of emergency needs to be limited to what is necessary to address the public health crisis in COVID. Unfortunately, what we've seen is that some states have imposed states of emergency, but they've spilled a little bit too far. They've used those states of emergency to repress freedom of speech, to repress demonstrations, uh, to repress um, uh, freedom of press or postings in media. Sometimes governments have have gone after and you know gone after people who've posted criticism of the government's um, COVID-19 response. And they've used the states of emergency laws about, you know, uh, about uh, acting against the public interest to try and prosecute or arrest um, people who've been criticizing the government. So we've seen, uh, we've seen a lot of human rights abuses under the cover of, uh, you know, states of emergency being used too much. Um, we've seen a lot of corruption. So of course, uh, states have had to be able to procure a lot of medical equipment very fast. Um, we understand that, but sometimes they have used the COVID as a justification for not only cutting corners in terms of very fast procurement, but actually um, allowing corruption to seek in as well. We've seen, uh, and this is a little bit linked, well, li li linked to the point I made earlier, we've seen a little bit of um, a tendency for some states to become a little bit more authoritarian. Um, some responses have been militarized. We've seen a lot of, uh, you know, some countries, we've seen a lot of former army personnel brought in, you know, to the COVID response and a, a general sense that, uh, a general sense that the, the, the democratic nature of society, the civilian nature of society has been a little bit overmined, undermined in some, in some countries. We've seen a lot of hate speech and misinformation. We've seen a, a lot of examples of people being stigmatized, communities being blamed, religious groups, ethnic groups being blamed for spreading COVID, uh, sometimes being subject to violence. And sometimes governments have been very good in fighting that, and sometimes governments have not been so good, and sometimes governments have actually been spreading the misinformation themselves. 
Uh, of course, the pandemic directly affected rule of law in one way because of the justice system, because courts had to close down. Courts could not keep on holding uh, uh, physical se sessions. But at the same time, we've seen an amazing transformation. We've seen an incredible digital transformation. Uh, in Bangladesh, um, it took just two weeks to issue the new legal framework for uh, our online court hearings. And in Bangladesh, they um, managed to hold 40,000 online bail hearings in three months, and they managed to release 11,000 people on bail and reduce the prison population by 10% in three months, all through online hearings of pretrial detainees. And now we're going to be working with the judiciary in Bangladesh to bring the same kind of, of electronic justice with electronic legal aid and virtual hearings for victims of um, gender-based violence, for workers who got laid off in the pandemic and didn't get their salaries, for um, small businesses that, uh, have, uh, that are struggling because they can't, uh, you know, because there are unpaid debts, and to help them be able to take their cases to court and that they can get justice. So, so we've seen incredible things happening in our region uh, about justice being able to be delivered online, just like this discussion is being delivered online. But we need to make sure that that, and that's going to become part of the, the future. I mean, online justice is here to stay. So we need to make sure that it happens the right way. Not everybody has access to the digital technologies. Um, you have to make sure that people can still just use a telephone uh, to be able to call in. You have to make sure that they have access or finance or that they are helped to be able, you know, that they, you know, if they, if they have to be able to have a, a hearing by, by telephone, you know, you have to make sure that they have the means and the devices to do it and that they have the di digital literacy to do it. So for some countries, they really have to play catch up uh, on digital transformation to make sure that they don't leave people behind in a world where justice has to be sought online. And then there are questions about transparency. We still need to make sure that members of the public can still watch a trial online. How do you do that? You can have a face stream, Facebook, uh, a live uh, Facebook stream, but people or on YouTube stream, but we have to be able to, or the courts can have it their own live, live streaming, but you have to be able to make those things available. And there are all kinds of questions about fair trial rights, making sure people can still have access to lawyers, and questions about the, the, you know, the, whether the procedures of the trials need to be adjusted for, for online hearings. So there are lots of questions there. Uh, and those things are all the more important because as Dr. Kiripong said, um, we had a pandemic of gender-based violence uh, following lockdowns. So uh, women who have survived um, domestic violence and other forms of gender-based violence, you know, they have even greater needs for access to justice than before. And then, you know, we have some other rule of law questions, because I said rule of law is about inclusion, participation, and accountability. So, of course, we have all, the, all of these questions, which are still rule of law questions. Are health services universal and equitable? There are some countries where you can only really get, get good uh, med good health response to COVID if you can afford a private hospital because the public systems are too badly defunded. Luckily, that's not the case in Thailand. Thailand has an excellent public health system. So I think in, in Thailand, I, I hope that one can say that health services are universal and equitable. Are stimulus packages reaching the people who need them? That's a very difficult question. We can really argue about that. So uh, that's a that's a rule of law question because it's a human rights question and it's a question about leaving no one behind. And here's the big question for 2021. Are vaccines going to be distributed to the people who need them most? Uh, are we going to get the prioritization right? Um, and then who are going to participate in the decisions about building back better? Because, you know, we need this new compact to address the climate emergency, to address inequality, to address uh, all the people who are being left behind, and we need a different development model coming out of COVID. Are governments listening to citizens? Are young people and women, uh, are, are their voices able to be heard? Are, you know, is the government speaking to them, uh, giving them a chance? Is there a public dialogue, a public discussion about building back better and about how the government systems, the growth model, um, the development model need to change coming out of COVID. Because like I say, participation in decision-making is a core part of rule of law. 
And of course, our business is doing their part as well. Just like I mentioned earlier, business, the private sector, they're actors in this too. So those are some of the questions that we are facing right now as we struggle through COVID and begin to plan the, the path out of COVID because we really do have to make sure that the, pan, the path out of COVID is aligned with those 17 goals. Okay, I think I've talked enough. Um, I don't know if we have any time for questions or whether I rabbit it on too long. So let's see, let's see if, what questions people have. Yes, we with. do, we do. We have uh, several questions uh, lining up here. Uh, may I call out the name of the person and please uh, help introduce yourself to friends and your designation. Um, and don't forget our house rule. Uh, please turn on your camera. So then at least I think our speaker can see your face here. So let's start off with um, uh, Now I can see. Yes. I can see some of you. Yes. So, um, hello. Um, could you hear me well? I can hear you well. I can't yes, see you yes. yet. Where are you? But uh, where, uh, where is she? <laughs> can you actually okay. call her? Yeah. Uh, so, so, should I um, raise my hand so that you will see me easier? Yeah, okay, so just raise my hand if over someone, there. If someone can zoom into your screen so that I can see you as well as hear you. But I can hear you very well. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, should I just ask my question? I have actually two questions. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you very much for such a qualified um, um, lecture. And uh, I have one question to what uh, maybe the, the, the history of introducing the notion of human rights to our uh, development agenda. So I, for my understanding, correct me if I'm, I'm wrong, I understand that human rights were not clearly pronounced um, in the MDGs uh, era, uh, but it became more uh, emphasized uh, when it comes to um, SDGs, so I guess there was a process, or there were might there might be uh, some resistance toward the notion of human rights, which associated with uh, the idea of universality, and also of course some resistance from um, the, the the South world. Um, so uh, maybe if um, you can um, you could clarify the process of how human rights became part of the development agenda uh, for um, the current world or for the SDGs? That is my first question. Okay, great question. So, you know, this was a hard struggle with many heroes. By the way, I want to say, I want to shout out to TIJ. TIJ was, was, is one of the heroes of the development agenda. One of the reasons why TIJ is uh, always putting the, you know, the SDGs function center, you know, TIJ um, has played a, a really crucial role in getting rule of law into the, and, and, and therefore human rights into the uh, into the agenda. One of the first things that happened when I came to live and work in Bangkok in 2013 was I was invited to this Bangkok dialogue on the rule of law. And I was like, what's that? And it was like the Thailand Institute of Justice invited to the Bangkok dialogue, to the, the dialogue on the rule of law. This was an event organized by Her Royal Highness the Princess, who is the, the um, pat patroness of the uh, Thailand Institute of Justice, with the great participation of, uh, of the Bhutanese um, Prime Minister, the Foreign Minister of Indonesia, uh, many kind of luminaries, to really talk about the importance of having rule of law in the Sustainable Development Goals. And so Thailand played a very honorable role as this Bhutan. I know we have a Bhutanese uh, representative, uh, you know, His, His Majesty, uh, you know, uh, and the Prime Minister of Bhutan played a very honorable role um, in, in supporting having rule of law uh, in the uh, in the agenda. And uh, not every country was as positive. Some Asian countries that will not be nameless but are among the biggest countries in the world, um, you know, were not so keen and were not so easily, you know, not so convinced. So there was a real struggle to get rule of law um, and the whole of Goal 16 into the agenda. In the same way, and for the same reason, you, you're right that you won't see references to human rights in the agenda. You'll see reference to fundamental freedoms in Goal 16, mm -hmm. but you won't hear it. It doesn't talk about itself as a human rights-based agenda. I talk about it as a human rights-based agenda. Mm -hmm. If I plot against, if I look at all the 169 targets in the SDGs, I can map all of them against human rights commitments. So human rights, 
the thinking and spirit of this agenda is 100% a human rights-based agenda because it is based on equality, because it is based on universality, because it is based on leaving no one behind and reaching the furthest behind first, because it covers all the most important social, economic, cultural, civil, and political rights. It's a, it's, so for me, it is a human rights agenda. And actually, I'm fine that it doesn't mention the words human rights, because when you mention human yeah. rights in some parts of the world, you get pushback. Oh, this is a Western agenda. Oh, you know, no, no, yeah. no, that's, you know, that's not appropriate. We have Asian values or other kind of values, not in our country. <laughs> now, I mean, it's nonsense. You know, right to education, gender equality, you know, health, hung, you know, these are universal values. These are the aspirations of everybody in the world. It's, it's, it's just a political, you know, line that some governments, which I won't name, come up with. That's why you won't see human rights in the agenda. But to be honest, it makes it easier. Because if human rights were kind of mentioned in the agenda, they'd be like, oh, well, this is a, this is a human rights uh, agenda. This is from the West. It's not for us. Whereas now, actually, we don't say that. Say, no, 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 this is an agenda about education. We all want education. So to be honest, it's OK with me. But it really is in the way it's actually been formed. And due to the more sensitive issues like access to justice and rule of law, having been heroically fought for by countries like Thailand and Bhutan and Indonesia, uh, as well as, of course, many other countries uh, in the world, it is, in the end, a human rights and rule of law-based agenda, even if it doesn't mention human rights. You have another question? Thank you. Yes, I have another question, but I'm not quite sure. Should I just proceed to my second question, or should I give the floor to the other? Go ahead. You, you OK. Also, your, your first question was great, and I loved it, so I want to hear your second question. Thank you very much. I, I, I'm, I'm quite happy to hear your answer as well. Uh, it's kind of um, enlightened um, the way that we should um, communicate or like engage with the different views toward um, the notion of human rights and rule of law as well. Um, so I actually forgot to introduce myself. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm sorry for that. Um, my name is Titi Rad. I, uh, I am lecturer at the Faculty of Law at Masat University. Uh, so my second question is on um, uh, is more toward to the end of your uh, lecture regarding the role of private sector. So um, I think we, we talk a lot uh, about the role of private sector in protecting human rights and also uh, um, uh, reinforce the rule of law as well. Uh, but in the context of um, digital environment today, that we see many tech companies play the role of gatekeepers in uh, um, the the, the uh, today's um, context of digital extraction, and um, such as what they've seen the social media uh, companies like Facebook, Twitter did it to President Trump uh, uh, through the, the, the event uh, some days ago, and there were. Uh, the voices uh, reacted to to those uh, to those uh, ban or sanctioned by private companies, um, both pro and cons. But we have some world leaders, such as Angela Merkel, uh, express her worry about uh, these might be giving out the role of law enforcer to the private companies. Uh, so like some scholars and also some leaders are worrying that uh, when we talk or when we emphasize too much on the role of private sector, that will kind of blurring the public, public and the role of public and private sector in that sense. And also uh, is, this relates to the idea of rule of law, the idea of consistency or accountability that you've said before, that usually we have to be uh, the, the, the law should be predictable, should be certain. So in that sense, if we allow or if we, uh, uh, yeah, if we allow the social media companies or even the other type of private companies to enforce the law or interpret the law in the way that it, it thinks fit, uh, wouldn't it, um, in, uh, it might be good in the sense that it, uh, it reinforced um, the protection of rights, but on the other way around, it might uh, undermine the certainty or predictability of law enforcement. What do you think about this? Look, I think this is a really important point. I mean, look, I, I'm not going to say this is an easy thing. There are, you know, there is a very difficult line that needs to be drawn, and 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 uh, and this is an issue that needs a lot of serious discussion. I mean, of course, it's not the private platforms. I mean, it's a very interesting discussion, of course, because you know, uh, because companies like Facebook and and Twitter 
you know, because of the position they hold, you know, they've almost become like, you know, like state channels. They've almost become like monopolies. And so they have enormous power. And uh, at the same time, of course, they're not actually, you know, enforcing laws. But it's, it is, of course, e equally very important. It's, it's equally true that the decisions they make have incredible impact. And really, in a sense, that's what I'm saying. I mean, they can't escape the fact that they're a private company. I, I'm not here really to say, you know, just, I'm not really talking about enforcing the law, but I'm it's very clear. Their acts, their decisions have incredible impact on people's lives and on people's rights. And so they do have a responsibility. I'm not going to say it's easy for them. They're not actually, they're not actually uh, enforcing the law. But the fact is, their platforms are used, can be used, to incite violence. And there are many examples of that. Um, you know, uh, if you read the report of the, uh, the, the UN's report on, on Myanmar and what happened to the Rohingya in Myanmar, you'll see that, you know, hate speech incited against Rohingya in Myanmar was a very serious problem. And Facebook, you know, I mean, Facebook didn't choose to be the platform, but Facebook was the platform through which hate speech which led to violence against Rohingya was propagated. And so Facebook was criticized by the UN for not taking down those posts. Right, and of course, you know, as soon as Facebook takes down those posts, we have the same debate that everyone is having now, and oh, well, you know, Facebook is now being the arbiter of what can be said. You know, tough luck, it is very hard. These decisions are very hard, but these decisions have enormous, have enormous consequences. And I am all for, uh, for example, tech companies taking those uh, taking those uh, re responsibilities very seriously. I am not sure yet whether tech companies are spending the right amount of resources monitoring what is posted in millions of languages in millions of countries. Of course, anything that you know, uh, Donald Trump posts, uh, everything's been monitored. That's very high and clear. I'm more worried about the hate speech which is being post posted in Bangla, in uh, you know, in Sinhala, in different languages, in different countries in this region. You know, and whether enough money is being spent on, 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 on monitoring that and taking it down, because that hate speech is causing real harm to communities, religious minorities, Muslims in Sri Lanka, Rohingya in Myanmar, and many others. Uh, and we have to really deal with that. And, uh, and at the moment, the model of tech companies is to a too large an extent to kind of ask civil society to do their monitoring, but not really give them very much resources or money to do it. And we are trying to help. But that's something I really want to see transformed. So I mean, I'm all for underlying the responsibility of tech companies and social media. Actually, the question about the responsibility of tech companies is an enormous one, which we could hold an entirely different session on. Actually, you know, I will go on about it for hours, so I won't. So I'm going to stop there. But just to say, it's not an easy question. There are there we could have a great discussion on both sides. Maybe I hope sometime in your program you should have a special session on that because this is a really interesting discussion. But just to say, yes, they have responsibility uh, mm -hmm. because the things that happen on their platforms have real consequences for people's lives. Next question. Yes. Next question, Kun uh, Santi. Uh, thank you, Mr. Bush, for your presentation. Uh, I'm Sandy. I work for UNICEF Thailand, and uh, I really like your 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 presentation uh, uh, on on the on the, the rule of law aspects. I think you I mentioned, think the, mentioned the, the four key areas, areas or aspects, aspect. starting, starting from the from accountability, accountability, accountability for all uh, uh, consistent uh, or compliance with the, with the human human rights standards. Uh, we also have also the transparency and equality, and the last one is the inclusive participation. I just did uh, a little research on the on the rule of law index for Thailand last year, and I found that for well, just this project, uh, uh, the ranking for Thailand is 71. It's not that bad, but I think this reflects a lot uh, in terms of there's still some areas of improvement and challenges. So we have to work on that. Uh, my my question is around that four aspect that you you just mentioned, and I think we may need to work around those area. But as you are the experts on the rule of law and you experience Thailand very much, uh, I would like to know your, your views on, you know, what should be the priorities that we have to work on around those areas. I have something in my mind too, but I, I, I just love to hear your, your thoughts around that. Thank you. The priorities for rule of law in Thailand. Did you say the priorities for, for, the priorities for rule of law in Thailand? 
Is that, is that, was that the question? I, I just want to make sure I, I heard the question. Okay. Yeah, yes, and I, I just, uh, and I also aroused the, the key aspect that you just mentioned, you know. Uh, I just want to hear your thoughts around, you know, what should be like, is accountability for all, or is it like, I think you mentioned something around the inclusive partic participation uh, in terms of the response to the COVID, but it's, it's like the global picture as well. So I just want to 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 yeah to get the benefit of yeah you are living here and you 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 learn a lot of Thailand also thank well, you. Okay. So I mean first of all I should say you know although I'm here living here in Bangkok I work for our regional office and my my role is to help all our country offices so I don't work for the country office so the country office is where the experts on Thailand are so the first thing I should say is I'm not an expert on Thailand and I and I don't work directly with Thailand. Uh, you know, that's what my country office is here. So I'm, gonna, I, I'm not going to get into much detail because, you know, I'm not the right expert. I'm going to say, as you say, the World Justice Project uh, Rule of Law Index puts Thailand somewhere in the middle, you know, 75. That's kind of where I would put it to. There are many very good things about the rule of law in Thailand. Um, you know, Thailand's got, uh, you know, a very strong public system, uh, you know, very strong bureaucracy. Um, it's, you know, it, it's got good legal education, um, it's, you know, it has a decent bar council, and, you know, it has many, many, you know, pretty good institutions, and, uh, but there's always room for improvement, right, and I think that you're right that, um, I mean, I think that some of the areas that, 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 I mean, when I simply listen, you know, when I read the newspapers in Thailand, I can tell that there's an open debate happening in Thailand at the moment, you know, around the, around the question of, of participation. I mean, uh, there are uh, real issues about whether everyone's voice is counted equally. There are issues about about participation. Um, and I think that there are some kind of, you know, some longer standing issues which are related to the rule of law, which, you know, I think that, that, that are still part of an ongoing dialogue. And I think that there's a lot, there's a lot to do. I mean, the fact that we're, you know, that we have a program like this, and I'm in an institute like Thailand Institute of Justice, you know, reminds us that we're in a country that's actually achieved a lot um, and has a lot of sophistication. But, you know, to be honest, uh, I come from the UK, and if you ask me, you know, if the UK could improve the rule of law, I would spend the rest of the day telling you the ways in which, you know, rule of law. It's actually one of the hardest things to get right. So the answer is that there, there, are, plenty of, there are plenty of areas, including, as you say, around the issue of, of public participation and around inclusion and around equality, um, there are plenty of issues that Thailand, like others, could be working on. Next sure. And the uh, third uh, question will basically coming from uh, Mr. Anand. I I'll read it out for you. Talking about the right to speak, how can balance, balance between the right of an individual and the benefits of the society? Very big question. Talking about the right to speak, uh -huh. how can we balance between the right of an individual and the benefits of the society. So, okay, you know, each of these questions, you know, we should look, we should go off and have a separate lecture on I know. Them because you know, you're not, you know, I these know. are not. I was having nice technical questions like, what is sixty point six thing? Whereas this is, you were asking me to, you know, to talk about the right of free speech. But I mean, the right of free speech is, a, is an essential right, and of course, it's not. You know, no human right is an unqualified right, and the most important qualification on the right of free speech is the one we've all been watching on our TV screens recently, that when speech incites violence, that then it's gone too far. So, I mean, the balancing is this, that speech which actually incites hate. So, the, so that, I'm going to mention two, there are, there are more than two. Two very, very important limitations. I mean, clearly, when you lie, in order to sow hatred and discord. I mean, you know, I hate to say, you know, I, 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 it's, it's unfortunate that the phrase fake news has had the connotations it has. But I mean, the fact is that untrue speech, misinformation, disinformation for the purpose of uh, actually sowing discord, so, you know, that has to be prohibited. So, so knowing falsity, but people, you know, knowingly spread lies. Of course, that, you know that that's one that's one thing that's outside the protection of free speech. But the other thing, of course, is incitement to violence. Right? And we can think of you know recent recent 
cases which have been said to be in cyber defiance. And of course, that is the reason why one would, for example, take down certain things off Twitter or Facebook, because they are inciting hatred. And we have a real problem with hate speech. And hate, you know, you know, there is a UN plan of action against hate speech. So that is the limitation of free speech. But of course, this is another very difficult line to draw because I recognize that a lot of people say things that they believe are true. And a lot of people, you know, are very uh, heated in their arguments. And one thing, something that once someone said to me, you know, with the, the recent elections in Myanmar, they said, well, the good thing is there wasn't much hate speech. We were afraid of hate speech because of the, 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 the history that I told you about. Luckily, there wasn't that much hate speech and we could deal with it. But what there was was a huge amount of polarization, right? And so we are living in a time of great polarization. And I'm afraid Thailand is, you know, like other countries. You know, I, I witness a lot of great polarization where people can't really debate and discuss with each other. But, you know, the fact is that we do have to allow people to speak passionately what they feel, even if we passionately disagree. And we need to find a way of bridging the gap so that people actually can recognize what they share in common and what they disagree on. And we need more speech, not less, to move away from the polarizing tendency we are having where people are transforming other people into kind of, you know, an existential threat. And, you know, they are seeing, they are drawing up battle lines, you know, and everything is turning into a war and other people's views and are seen as somehow destroying everything they stand for. We, we need to roll this back. This is a very, very dangerous tendency. So for that, we need more speech, but better speech. Um, and so uh, for me, you know, free speech gets the priority, but we have to come down very hard where it's used to incite violence, and especially where people you know, deliberately manipulate false falsehoods in, in order to harm other people. Next question. All right. The next question actually is um, regarding to another case study of uh, the land of uh, with a free of speech. I mean, uh, Mr. Se Yun Joo from South Korea, please. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, my name is Se Yun. Uh, I'm from South Korea, and um, I work for Korean Institute of Criminology. And um, I also would like to uh, raise a question uh, in re uh, in relation to the uh, recent incident in the uh, United States. Uh, the mob violence that happened in Capitol Hill. And I'd like to bring to your attention the distinction between the participatory democracy and um, the deliberative democracy. And a recent Washington Journal article uh, highlighted the distinction by saying that um, the former uh, can be hijacked by a passionate believer uh, to suffocate a pluralism, while the latter deliberative, deliberative democracy um, is in which you know elected representative will use a reason and a persuasion uh, to shape the public discourse. So uh, you talked about the uh, formulating the SDG uh, rule of law framework, and it and it uh, to my understanding it included the accountability and inclusion. But um, I feel like the recent incident highlighted that the um, accountability and inclusion can be intention. So. Um, in your formulation of the rule of law in uh, within the SDG uh, framework, uh, did you envision such attention? And um, whether it's the case or not, like how would you like address such tension uh, within the framework? Good heavens! I mean, you know, we have such big questions in this thing. I, I feel I feel like we should actually like you know put in a tile we can start. Okay, so those very big questions. Tell me more about why you think. Why precisely do you think there's a tension between inclusion and accountability? Uh, because, like, uh, for the inclusion part, uh, I think that's the another word for uh, participatory uh, democracy. We'd like to have more people uh, voice their concerns. Yes. Uh, to the uh, you know the uh, p uh, p political authority, but then um, sometimes you know w when you have more people included in the uh, you know, debate. People can be, you know, can become violent or passionate. Right. So that's where we have to draw the line. I mean, so if you ask me, you know, where the tension is, violence is the line. I mean, even though I, you know, so clearly I don't believe that, you know, that the election was stolen. I mean, you know, quite clearly having watched 75 lawsuits, all dismissed for lack of evidence, I am completely convinced 
you know, in the integrity of the American electoral system and completely convinced that Joe Biden will do the elected president. So, you know, I mean, I'm not going to say that I sympathize with or agree with the people who wanted to protest outside the Capitol, you know, about what they thought for whatever reason was going on in the election. However, if you said to me, you know, should those people be allowed to protest outside the Capitol, have big banners and say, you know, stop the steal, yeah, absolutely, they had the right to do that. I'm all in favor of that. You know, I have no, well, I mean, I have no problem with them exercising their right of democratic protest. If their view that, that they've come to for whatever reason, the problem came that they actually, you know, they broke into the Capitol. They had guns. They broke windows. They threw fire extinguishers at policemen and killed them. So, I mean, you know, that's a very easy line. Violence is the unacceptable line. I think it's not so hard I think it's not so hard to draw a line. We shouldn't be afraid of human rights. All human rights have limitations on them. Violence is always the limitation. Deliberate falsehood of manipul and manipulation is always the limitation. So I don't think that we need worry about, but I mean, but it's, it's absolutely true that every human right, you know, can potentially be in tension with another human right, and we have to balance interests. And, you know, and I'm not saying these things are easy. There are no absolutes, right? That's the, that's the job of, of human rights and lawyers to do it. Okay, I think as much as we have time on that question, because it's a very big question. It's very that's difficult. right, that's right. And I think we have only 10 minutes left, I think, for two last questions that we have from uh, Mr. Nopon and Ms. Tai Tai. Please, I think, keep, keep it brief, please. Right, uh, thank you. My name is Nopon. Uh, I run a startup in the circular economy space here, um, based in Thailand. So, I'm just wondering, in your view, um, how can the rule of law be used to, um, number one, promote human rights and equality in the face of um, socially embedded racial discrimination, um, as might be the case with refugees or ethnic minorities in certain countries, etc. And number two, um, to promote environmental protect protection at the perceived loss of economic benefit and financial gains. Yeah, so just two questions here, row into one. Thank you. Can, can you repeat the first one? So I, 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 I heard the, the, the second one I heard clearly, which is the tension between, you know, economic benefits and uh, and, uh, and environmental uh, environmental protection. Yeah. So what about the so first one? So, okay, the first um, promote human rights and human rights and equality in the face of um, widely spread or socially embedded racial racial discrimination. So this might be the case with refugees in certain certain countries or ethnic minorities, for example. Yeah. But, but but what's your question? Your, your question is, is is how we, what is our strategy to? Because in in the face of like um, widespread racial racial discrimination, uh, maybe a rule might not be enacted um, to to promote human rights, for example, or to promote equality among all the races or ethnic minorities. So is, is your question how we? So how could we reconcile? So is your Pardon? question how, what we should do to overcome to overcome this Hello? widespread? Sorry, is the question how we should overcome the widespread uh, racial discrimination? Yes, through the rule of law, yes. for example. So, I mean, I can say that, yeah. Well, you know, history has got some great examples. I mean, uh, well, you know, for as much as... Okay, so the States, is a, the States is a fascinating country because you see how much of a long path they still have, of course, to deal with uh, racism in the States. But at the same time, we should recognize the incredible transformation that has happened since the 1950s. You know, as the result of the civil rights movement, the civil rights movement led to the Civil Rights Act. And, and the Civil Rights Act was an extraordinary piece of legislation in America, which also became a trailblazer and inspired the rest of the world. So in my own country, you know, the Race Relations Act and the Sex Discrimination Act in the 1970s uh, you know, were in cell, themselves inspired by the Civil Rights Act of the 60s. And I witnessed for myself an incredible transformation. So, I mean, I live in, I, I was born and brought up in the UK. And, you know, the first thing I would say is that the UK is still a country with huge amounts of racism, huge amounts of discrimination, huge imbalances. But at the same time, I've also seen a great transformation in people's attitudes and a huge I mean, a huge amount of progress since the 1970s when those laws were brought in. And I mean, uh, that used to be my area of practice. I used to you know, litigate those cases. I used to litigate race discrimination 
uh, sex discrimination, disability discrimination cases. So I kind of saw at first hand the power of law and the rule of law, not on its own, you know? I mean, it, it started as a movement, and the movement is very important. And, you know, the civil rights movement was, were, uh, in the States was one of the most inspiring in the world, and the movement led to law. And law was the moment when the state recognized and acknowledged and validated the movement, and then after the two of them moved together. And they still have a huge way to go. And, you know, you see that particularly, you know, in issues around policing in the States. You, you see that in many, many other issues. But we shouldn't... That we shouldn't mistake the amount that was achieved and the role that rule of law played in that. The role of the rule, rule of law plays in any in 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 fighting back any kind of discrimination. And part of the reason it does is because when the state enacts equality and gives remedies for equality and against discrimination, the state is really reaffirming the human dignity of people. I'm going to say that, I mean, I myself felt, felt this, you know, very powerfully myself because, you know, I was, you know, I was a gay man born in a country where, you know, initially, you know, it was illegal for me to have sex with anybody and then I had to wait longer than anybody else, you know, but it was fine for me to have sex as long as I didn't want to get married or have children or adopt children. And, you know, gradually, one by one, all of those things changed. And the thing is that, you know, it was incredibly important uh, when, you know, those laws changed. I mean, you know, we, and we still have this problem. So there are a lot of countries in Singapore, Malaysia, Myanmar, a lot of countries that still criminalize, you know, homosexuality. And then some people say, well, it doesn't matter. I mean, you know, no, when was the last time anyone ever went to prison in Singapore, you know, because they were, you know, because of gay sex? You know, they don't enforce it. It doesn't matter. It does matter. And it matters because as long as those laws remain on the books, they are signaling the lack of dignity, the lack of, the, you know, the, the state doesn't count those people's lives as equal. It doesn't respect their dignity to live equally with other people, to love the way they want to. And I felt that profoundly. So from that experience, I know how important it is, you know, that the legal framework reaffirming equality and reaffirming the fight against discrimination is the most powerful thing a state can do to, to show its commitment to the quality of its citizens. So that, you know, I think the rule of law has a very powerful role to play. But thanks for the question. Oh, sorry, and you also asked about, uh, about environment. Gosh, well, that's another, that's another big topic. You know, and, 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 you know, but so short-sighted because, you know, we are, I mean, letting, leaving alone, I mean, let alone environmental pollution, you know, climate change. I mean, you know, we're running headlong into a catastrophic disaster. And, you know, we've all now experienced how devastating the impact of something like a pandemic can be and how suddenly such a shock like that can fall. So, I mean, I hope that everyone has had a wake-up call on how completely their lives can be transformed by nature and that should give them pause to think about, you know, just how bad our lives could be if climate change is not stopped and reversed right now. So, you know, I think when it comes down to short term and long term, I mean, because when you talk about economic benefits, this is only a short term thing. In the long term, the economic benefit is towards a cleaner environment, cleaner air, better health, cleaner water, and addressing climate change. It's only a short term vision that could say otherwise, right? And 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 uh, and so I think that for me that there's really no no dilemma there. It's it was incredible short termism for me for uh, you know some governments not you know to take to uh, and some countries not to sign the Paris Accord and to uh, to take away the environmental protection rules they had. And I think uh, quite honestly that China is going to be the great winner. China has placed its bets on being the world's leading country on green technologies and, uh, you know, in the, in the future as well as, uh, as well as in AI and other things. I mean, I think China, you know, is the far-sighted one. This is a personal view, not a United Nations view, I, ha I hasten to say. But when I look on how China, you know, is, it, you know, China is looking at what the world is going to be like in 50 years, and it wants to be the strongest country in 50 years' time. And it has decided that the strongest country in 50 years' time will be the country that has become the leader in sustainable technologies, energy efficient, carbon neutral, and so on. And to be honest, I think the Chinese are right. 
And the Chinese, believe me, are not doing this out of altruism. They're doing this out of an understanding about what, where, where, where economic and political power is going to lie. Do we have one last question? Yes, one last question from Ms. Sai Jai, please. Hi, um, my name is Sai Jai. Um, I work on hate speech and social media monitoring, especially the issue of Facebook in Myanmar that lead to genocide. So I think you have been mentioned a lot about this. Um, I think from my work, I actually witnessed the lack of rule of law in the way technology is built and managed. So my question to you is that, how could we apply the rule of law concepts to the future challenges, for example, with the way AI is making decisions and the way of biotech? So yes, yeah, so if you could speak more on that. Thank you. Okay. Well, if, if, there, if ever there was a, a last question that I couldn't give a short answer, I just say I profoundly agree with you. And this is something that we have uh, put on our agenda as, uh, as one of the most important questions that we need to be dealing with in the, the current years. We have not, um, we have allowed, I mean, the world has allowed the tech giants to transform the world at incredible speed and regulation hasn't caught up with it. And now these companies are much bigger um, than any one country. No one country has the power to be able to regulate them on, on, on their own. And we are only beginning to start looking at what needs to be done. But, you know, the good news is we are starting to wake up. So, I mean, of course, the first issue that was identified was the issue around the use of data. And the European Union led the way with GDPR. And GDPR is great. And it's powerful. And, you know, they were the first movers. And it was a sign that, that actually the world can start to be able to develop regulation to deal with the new risks and threats that are posed by new technology. But as you rightly say, that's only one. And, in, uh, and with artificial intelligence, um, with biotech, many other, we have a lot of moral and legal dilemmas that we need to solve. And I don't think that we have yet drawn up, uh, we, we've not yet found, we've not yet had enough discussion or, or come up with enough of a game plan to do so. And until we do, I think that there is a real risk of impunity for, uh, for, the, for, the, for the major tech companies. So yes, it's a big priority.